heart. Give it up for our musicians this morning. They're here week in and week out. They never miss, and I appreciate so much their consistency uh, here at the church. This past week, I uh, sat there and I watched the television. I think it was on Wednesday. And I was absolutely horrified by the news story that came across the airwaves. Incidentally, everyone that's joining us by the Internet this morning or watching in our archives, we're glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming our direction and spending time with us. If you have any questions at all about God, about religion, about faith, about Christianity, um, no matter the size of the question, big or small, complex or simple, I'd love an opportunity to dialogue with you. You will see on your screen throughout the course of our time together today some uh, contact information, an email, a phone number. Again, just don't hesitate. Get in touch with me, and I'd love to uh, have a chance to talk with you at your leisure. But as I was saying just a second ago, I watched on Wednesday, absolutely horrified, and I suspect some of you can relate to it, but I was watching the video clip that came across the uh, airwaves or the newscasts that showed the downing of the Ukrainian International Airline Flight 752. How many saw that? The downing of the Ukrainian Airline Flight 752. And uh, that's the actual airplane that was shot down. And uh, I got to thinking, I was, I was researching it and looking into uh, exactly what happened and trying to get as much information as I possibly could uh, because I have uh, an affinity for safe air travel because I travel by air so much. And so this airplane, it took off late. It banked at 6.14 p.m. to the right beginning to set its chart, chart its course and set its course for its ultimate destination in the city of Kiev, when at 6.14, that was the last transmission that was received, an MR-1 uh, surface-to-air Russian-made missile, a Tory MR-1 surface-to-air missile, uh, pierced the aircraft. Go on ahead if you don't the mind. The first time tonight, Play this... That. What appears to be the moment that 737 is hit by a missile. This video shot in the neighborhood of the last track position of the Ukrainian jetliner. That missile can be seen streaking upwards right before impact, the sound following seconds later. The crippled jetliner in this video posted by a resident outside Tehran shows the plane apparently on fire, breaking apart and crashing three miles away. That impact also captured by C. CCTV video, which close. is airing on Iranian media, and, uh, the moment me, of impact horrifying. with debris streaking past the camera. Yeah, All videos terrifying. reinforcing Western... In For the first time seconds. tonight, Imagine this, being on what appears airplane. to be the moment... This may sound strange, but in my estimation, the ones who were fortunate on that plane were the ones that were killed immediately upon impact. Can you imagine the sheer terror of 45 seconds falling out of the sky. That aircraft had to be filled with some of the most torturous shrills. I mean, screams and cries and agonizing groans. I mean, I've been on a lot of aircraft in my time. And when you go through something called turbulence and you hit those air pockets and the plane drops a couple thousand feet instantly, uh, it's kind of upsetting. Has anybody ever been in one of those situations on an airplane? You see, I can relate. I can somehow relate at least a little bit uh, to what happened up there because I used to be a very fearful flyer. I remember when I began flying all the time, the ministry began growing, and the kids were at home back here in Texas with Denise, and I had no alternative but to fly if I ever wanted to see the kids. And so I began flying all the time to my meetings, and uh, when I first began to fly, I remember so well, I was having a conversation with a lady that was sitting next to me, and she looked over and said, you're a nervous flyer, aren't you? And of course, in my male bravada, and in my egotistical, masculine way, I said, no, I am totally under control, this is no problem for me. Never mind the fact, she said, and she really did say this, she said, well, you're like 
pale as a ghost and your knuckles are turning white because you've got your seat clenched so tightly. Uh, she read the obvious outward evidences and she knew that I was a novice at flying. The crazy thing is I've flown hundreds of different flights now and the strange thing is we can hit all kind of air pockets and that plane can jump up and down and if I'm not sleeping I'm enjoying it because it's a new adventure. But back in the day when I first got started it scared me to death. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be on that airplane. I was looking up a list of fears that most people have, the top ten fears that people have. Uh, the fear of dogs, the fear of snakes, uh, the fear of spiders, the fear of needles. What did not make the list was the fear of dentists or the fear of public speaking. You had the fear of holes, but then you also had what was called acrophobia. Acrophobia is the fear of heights. <laughs> I, I remember one time I was at the top of a Hancock building over there in Chicago, and I walked over to the window because the window is right there. It serves as the wall of the Hancock building. And uh, it's one of the tallest buildings in the United States. And the pastor friend that I was with, he had just bought me a buffet lunch. And I think he took me up to that top floor because he was setting me up for something. I think he was willing to spend that kind of money because he knew he was going to have a sadistic laugh at my expense. And so I walked over to the window and I was already, you know, starting to suffer with vertigo. When the guy walks up to me and he pushes me. That was the end of our friendship. It was case done. This thing's complete. Adios. I'm out of town. You, y'all you, still out there with me? Yeah. Uh, so acrophobia is the fear of heights. And then you have aerophobia, the fear of flying. Can you imagine falling out of the sky 7,925 feet? Gravity equals 32 feet per second squared. Which means when you're falling, you are accelerating the entire time until the force going downward equals the resistance moving upward. And at 122 miles per hour, you basically level off to the same speed. But don't worry, it's already past terminal velocity. That is to say, you have no hope of survival. These people fell out of the sky at 122 miles an hour. Do we have a picture of the ground scene? Do you have a picture of the ground scene? And of course you can see there's the result. The green body bags. Uh, I'm th I think I'm safe to say that when something like this happens, fear takes over. I can tell you that years ago, Back in 2012, I had a medical crisis that could have been life-ending. Life uh, strangely enough, when I was going through the process and the medical team was working on me, I, I never felt fear. I felt no moment of fear at any point in time. Not to say that if I was on this aircraft, I would not have soiled myself. I'm sure I would have resulted in some kind of bodily function. But when it comes to the subject of fear, guys, I don't know about this, but it kind of gripes me. There's all kind of superficial and stupid slogans that have been written trying to help us overcome our respective fears. And so oftentimes, those superficial slogans are nothing but shallow answers to the real problems that we face in life. Who can ever forget when the, when the United States was in the middle of a horrible depression? And in 1933, in March of 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stood on the east portico of the government building, the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., and he, and he had the Bible open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and he raises his hand. He takes the oath of office, and then he makes the statement. He says that uh, the only thing we have to fear, remember that, is fear itself. He called it, unrelenting, unnecessary fear. Well, the fact of the matter is, sometimes fear is necessary, and sometimes fear 
is unrelenting. For those of you that are Star Wars fans, and I think Blaine would appreciate this, Yoda said that fear is the path to the dark side. I can't think of anything worse than watching Star Wars for my philosophical inspiration. Like Dale Carnegie, the guy that wrote the book How to Win Friends and Influence People, he said, if you want to conquer fear, don't sit at home thinking about it. Get up and do it. Fear. Has anybody in this room ever dealt with fear? Perhaps are you dealing with fear right now? Well, there's something good I've got to tell you today. The Bible deals with the subject of fear. As a matter of fact, fear is so common in the human experience, the Bible speaks about it over 600 different times. Remember when God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac to the land of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice there before God, the Lord said to Abraham, do not fear. When Moses is leading the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and they come to the Red Sea, what was it that God needed to say to Moses so he would not wilt in the heat of the conflict? He said to Moses, don't be afraid. When Joshua takes over the armies of Israel and it's time to go into the land of promise, Joshua's 85 years of age. He's been down this road before. He's seen how God's taken care of his people. And yet God has no choice but to say to Joshua, I've commanded you to be strong and of a good courage. Don't be afraid because wherever you go, I go with you. Now, doesn't that sound wonderful? The Bible tells us, don't be afraid. I step back and I say, God, thank you for the instruction, but exactly how do I do that? We just celebrated Christmas. And, of course, the Christmas story revolves around the virgin birth. Can you imagine being a 14-year-old virgin and an angel shows up in front of you? If I'm standing in front of an angel, I'm already beginning to shake, especially if I'm a young teenager. And Gabriel looks at Mary and says, don't be afraid. Come on, you've got Bible story after Bible story. Peter starts walking on the water, imitating Christ. And as he begins to sing, Jesus says, Peter, come on, there's a theme here. Don't be afraid. The Apostle Paul is sailing on a ship. He's headed to his next missionary journey. And the winds and the waves begin to howl. The boat begins to take on water. And Paul hears those assuring words from God, don't be afraid. You see, the Bible demands that we're not fearful. But how come it is the Bible gives me demands and commands that are so against my nature? Oh, I know you guys out there this morning, you never deal with fear. Huh. Good for you. Now for everybody else that is honest. Let me say that the emotion of fear is a good thing. As a matter of fact, the emotion of fear has been given to us by God. The emotion of fear actually serves as a defense mechanism. It helps keep us safe. I remember one night I left Blaine's house. And uh, we had been over there, I think, for a football game or I think it may have been the Super Bowl. And uh, I, I, took out of, I took out of the house, and there were two young guys that left the game after me. They left maybe 45 seconds or two minutes after me. And uh, as I was driving down 820 on my way home, the two guys that were on, uh, let, me, let me say it this way, the two guys that left the house behind me then came up behind me on their motorcycles. They had to be traveling 100 and 20 miles an hour on wide open interstate. And the daring duo is sitting back there this morning, Zach and Austin. It's good to see you guys that drive your motorcycle 120 miles an hour. But can I tell you something? Let, 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 me, let me tell you something. Fear is a defense mechanism. And it's a strange thing how our focus of fear changes and in the process changes our perspective. You see, I was in Nigeria doing a missions, missions trip one year, and back in 2003, the State Department told me, don't go. 
And when I went there, sure enough, I understood why it was the State Department did not go. A cor uh, corrupt police force was, was taking over that part of the country, and there was all kind of guerrilla activity, and mercenaries were toting their rifles trying to take money from people by extortion or by force. And they pulled my car over to the side of the road, and they started demanding my money. And when the escort I was with said, we're not going to give you his money, they promptly pulled out the machine gun and pointed it toward my head. All right, now this is a strange thing. I was fearful. But listen to me. The fear that I felt wasn't fear for my own life. The fear that I felt was for the loss of my life and how it would affect my wife and my children. I, I somehow think, and I may be wrong, but I somehow think that Zach and Austin probably aren't going to drive their motorcycles 120 miles an hour down Interstate 820 anymore. Not because they fear for their own mortality, but because they fear for the loss of their lives as it regards Eden and Grayson and, and what will those two girls do without their daddies. Understand the emotion of fear. It's a good thing. You know I wasn't going to pass that up, not for a second. God gives us fear as a defense mechanism. It keeps us safe. And not only do human beings have that defense mechanism, He gives it to every creature in His creation. I mean, think about the rabbit as it jumps from the brush when it hears the arrival of an encroaching predator. I mean, think about the deer that runs from the thicket. His afternoon has, his nap in the afternoon has been interrupted by the shot of gunfire. I mean, just think about the mouse that you corner in your basement. It's instinctual. Fear for survival is instinctual. I don't pay the IRS guys because I necessarily enjoy writing a check to the federal government. I write a check to the IRS because I fear time in Leavenworth. We actually had a prison guard from Leavenworth come and visit us one time. I asked him all about Leavenworth. Uh, fear. Why do I fear? The emotion of fear is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, homeowner's insurance. Why do you purchase homeowner's insurance? Because you are fearful of the worst case scenario. I don't necessarily enjoy paying those premiums of $145 every month. But I do so because I fear financial ruin should that home go up in fire. God has given us a boundary, and that boundary is called fear. It preserves us. It keeps us alive. But that boundary of fear He's given us is also moral. It, saves, it serves in the same capacity. The fear of God is designed to save your soul from imminent destruction. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And when you no longer fear the ways of God and the moral laws of God, you're setting yourself on a course for incredible ruination and incredible lifelong struggles. How many people have I counseled that are dealing with diseases that are chronic? dealing with relationships that are toxic and will not, not, will not end simply because they said, I'm going to do things my way. Forget about the moral boundaries of God. I have no fear of the outcome. And when the outcome arrives, you're now fearing how to survive the next day. Ignoring those inhibitions that God puts in your life called fear, lead to making decisions that are disastrous in their results. My flesh trembles for fear because of you. I'm afraid of your judgments. We've got the idea that God's up there in heaven running some kind of game show. Let's make a deal. That's not how God operates. He doesn't say, let's make a deal. He says, this is the deal. This is how you're going to live. This is how you're going to walk. The emotion of fear, it's a good thing. But then the Bible talks to us about something called the spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear doesn't come from God. It comes from the enemy. And I am convinced that the spirit of fear, disease kills thousands. 
fear kills millions. Come on, guys. Are you with me out there? Disease kills thousands. Fear kills millions. And the greatest crisis will come from our fear of trouble. I've discovered that most of the time people fear trouble when trouble never even shows up. We fear the possibility of trouble. And most of the time what we fear never even happens. Here's the problem though. Unbridled fear escalates into excessive fear and psychiatrists call that excessive fear phobias. They say that there are 75 distinct phobias in the world today. I gave you just a list of a few. The fear of needles, the fear of dogs, how anybody could be afraid of a dog, I don't know, maybe a cat I could understand, but I can't get a dog. The fear of, the fear of holes. We had a church come in the other day and they were looking to rent the property and they went back into the children's church room. And in the children's church room we have our mascot. You know, the children's church room is called the jungle. It looks like a jungle. And our mascot in there is about a five-foot-long ball python. Gorgeous creature. How many don't know that we've got a gorgeous ball python in the kids' church? He's, he's our mascot. I'm, I'm, first of all, I had, a group, I had a group come in last week. They said, Pastor, if we're going to rent this church, you've got to get this thing out of here. That's of Satan. <laughs> I promptly pulled Bella out and gave her a kiss. She's the sweetest thing. She loves to kiss. Then yesterday, actually when the tongue is, what's, you, know what, you know what a snake is doing when its tongue's out? It's smelling. Yeah, it's smelling you. And then the other the church came in yesterday, like, Pastor, we'd like to rent the property, but you've got to tell us, that thing can't be there. It has to be moved or we can't, we can't rent the property. Fear of snakes. Zach, you just got a corn snake the other day, right? You've got a bearded dragon and a couple pit bulls. People are scared to death of pit bulls. Fear. Fear debilitates. Excessive fear produces phobia. The spirit of fear is something that's universal. And let me say this. The spirit of fear is not of God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. As a matter of fact, turn, pull that up if you don't mind. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I want everybody to see this. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Say it again, guys. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. What could you do if you were not paralyzed by the spirit of fear? Fearful to even try. Fearful of the consequences. What will the outcome be? I remember when I began flipping homes. My wife and I had more intense conversations over flipping homes that I care to think about. And she continued to voice her fear. Was it a founded fear? Well, after last year, it was an intelligent and wise fear and a counsel I should have listened to. But I've discovered something. I have survived the worst of that financial collapse, and I'm still here. And I'm not going to settle for mediocrity. I'm not going to settle for normalcy. I'm not going to settle for just let the thing Go as it is and don't try again. Man, if you try and you fall down, get back up and continue trying. Come on, guys. If you fall flat on your face, at least you can say, I fell forward. I didn't fall going backwards. For heaven's sakes, it's worth trying. Roosevelt said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I got to tell you, I think that's kind of stupid. What does that even mean, the only thing we have to fear it's fear itself. Yeah, there are times that things will do us damage, but I always say consider the cost. Whenever a man builds a house, does he not first sit down, Jesus said, and count the cost? That's exactly what he said. Let me ask you a very personal question this morning. What could you do if you weren't seized by fear, the fear of even trying? Okay, God has not given, now watch this, God's not given me the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So where does this fear come from? I want to say it again, the spirit of fear is the curse on all humanity. 
The only people that don't fear are people that need put in the psych unit. You may disagree with that. I, I, I mean, the biggest, the bravest, the strongest was, I'm not afraid of anything. Man, you meet them, they say that. Let me tell you something. The biggest and the bravest and the strongest say, I'm not afraid of anything. Take them over to the Danny K. Hospital in Memphis and see what happens to them when their child is diagnosed with a childhood cancer. You'll watch the, yeah, I'm not afraid of anything. Wilt in fear. Paralyzed by the thought that their child might not live another year. Yeah, there's people that don't fear. I mean, like the crazy guy over there in West Fort Worth a couple weeks ago that walked into the church with a trench coat on. He pulled out a sawed-off shotgun, and he blew two people away. It's crazy. All right, but I'm talking about people that are rash and sane. Where does it come from? If you don't mind, Aaron, pull up for me Genesis chapter 3. I think it's verses 9, 10, and 11. Uh, God, you know the story. God comes looking for Adam. And he says, Adam, uh, where are you? Now watch it. And Adam says, well, I heard you walking around the garden. Here it is. But I was afraid because I was naked. Boom. There's where fear came into the world. The spirit of fear. What does verse 11 then say? God is trying to show Adam what it was that put fear there in the first place. I heard you coming, and I hid myself because I knew I was naked. I was afraid when I heard your footsteps. Let me tell you something. The only thing that breaks the curse of fear is the power of the God that was offended in the Garden of Eden in the first place. And because man lives in fear, God loved us so much, he gave his son, and his son forged through the human fear of crucifixion. He was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Bible said he's praying. He's praying under this incredible duress. It says that his, he, began to, he began to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. People say that's just figurative. It's not. It's it's a medical phenomenon, phenomenon called hemiotridosis. It's when there's so much pressure on your body, the subcutaneous capillaries begin to burst, and your body begins to actually, with its sweat, also sweat out droplets of blood. Mankind was under the curse of fear, but Jesus Christ put on the form of human flesh. He moved beyond the fear of human instinct and prayed, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he gave himself on Calvary's cross, and three days after he died, my Bible said he rose again. And when he rose from the dead, death was defeated. And if I am raised with him into newness of life, I no longer need to fear the grave. I no longer need to fear what the enemy can do to me. I need to walk in the authority that Christ has given me by overcoming sin, death, and the grave. All right, I'm not done. I want you to take out your notebooks. I am going to give you what the spirit of fear produces. Four deadly consequences to the spirit of fear. And I won't take much time. But I want you to write this down. If you don't write this down, it means you're not interested in learning. Well, you, I don't have a pen. Then pull out your phone and you take notes in your phone. So what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you right now can change your life. If you're glad with, or you're, if you're satisfied with your life the way it is, well, God bless your little life. But I, for those of you that want some change, those of you guys that are watching me on the internet right now and you're sick and tired of the same old mess week in and week out, and you say anger, I'm willing for, I'm, I'm willing to try. I want to see some change. Take down these notes. Number one, fear attacks the mind. Where does it begin? Fear begins by attacking the mind. And when fear attacks the mind, what it does is it distracts our attention. And instead of focusing on our job, we're focusing on the potential for failure in our job. And the result is it totally jeopardizes our productivity. Fear distracts our attention and it jeopardizes our productivity. Instead of focusing on the task, we focus on the possibility of failure. And we never even tackle the task at hand. 
And if you're not careful, when, when you allow the spirit of fear to attack your mind, it becomes the force by which you're motivated. What motivates you? What is it that, come on, what is it that motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Fear of losing your job? Fear of not being able to pay the rent? Fear of what? You see, if we would approach our jobs in the secular marketplace without the motive of fear, but instead with the motive of being all that we can be, a lot of us would enjoy promotions that right now we don't enjoy. Okay. Left unchecked, fear becomes an obsession. Fear debilitates. And when fear begins to debilitate, it destroys our sense of reasoning and rationale. I was, at a, I was at a meeting this week over in Texarkana. This is a true story. They told me this. The person told me this. They said that, uh, I, I, yeah, they said, no, oh, was it a second party? No, it was the husband. He said, yeah, we were, we were preparing to go to the mission field. We were preparing to go to the mission field. And he said, I got up one night, and at the end of the bed I could see a demon. And so I began to rebuke the demon. I mean, I rebuked the demon. I said everything I could say to the demon. In the name of Jesus, I began to quote Scripture. And that demon wouldn't budge. He said, I got more and more intense, and I rebuked the demon. I told that demon, that demon has to leave. You've got to leave this house. And that demon didn't leave. Finally, because the situation was so intense, he woke up his wife. He shakes her awake and says, sweetheart, there's a demon in the room. I need you to help me pray and rebuke this demon so that it leaves the room. She sits up in bed. She looks back at her husband and says, that's just your coat over the chair. Now go back to sleep. That's a true story. Sometimes we fear things that aren't even there. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. All right, we're in school now. Four things that the spirit of fear does. Number one, it attacks your mind. Are you with me? Number two, it's contagious. Fear not only affects the person in question, it begins to affect the whole group. Can I give you an example? Numbers chapter 14. God tells Israel, go into the land to promise. It's all yours. I mean, enjoy it. And so Moses sends out, remember, 12 spies? And it's the, you know, listen to me, it's the job of the 12 spies to go in and say, this is positioned here, that is positioned north, the other is positioned to the west. And those guys come back and they begin to give their report to Moses and instead of telling Moses exactly what there is to expect, their report is, we've seen the Gergeshites, we've seen the Hittites, we've seen the Jebusites, we've seen the Canaanites. Those guys are up there, up there in the mountains. That other group of people, they're so big, man, we feel like we're nothing but grasshoppers next to them. And they begin to give this negative prognostication. I know God gave us the land, but there's too many enemies in the land. And what happens? All the people listened to the report of the ten spies that said we can't do it. Only two spies stood up and said we can. Is anybody out there with me? Twelve spies went out, ten came back and said, let's not even try it. Two spies said, God's given us the land, so let's go on in. Why? Because fear is contagious. And who did Israel side with? The two that said we can or the ten that said we can't? The ten that said we can't. And because of that, God said, all right, you're faithless. Go wander for 38 more years until that generation dies out and a new generation is raised up that believes me. Man, that's a sermon within itself. The Lord is my helper. Whom shall I fear? What shall men do to me? Hebrews 13 and 6. All right, fear is first of all, what? An attack on the mind. Number two, fear is contagious. Number three, the spirit of fear becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Man, write this down, guys. This is good stuff. Fear becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What did Job 3 and 25 say? The thing I greatly feared has come upon me. Why does fear become a self-fulfilling prophecy? Because when you live in fear, everything that you look at, you look at through the prism 
of fear and failure. You can't see anything other than fear. Therefore, if you live through the prism of fear, the only thing you will do is fear. And your life will be one failure after the next, after the other. Can I say this? I have known people that have lived in fear. Here's a really good word. Fear is probably one of the greatest means by which people sabotage their futures. You know the word sabotage. They sabotage their futures. And then number four, and I'm done with this. Number one, fear attacks the mind. Number two, fear is contagious. Number three, fear becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And number four, fear declares God a liar. Fear declares God a liar. Do you have Bible for it? I do. Pull up 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18 if you don't mind, please. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, and I'll be finished with this. We can go back to talking about Yoda. Fear is the path to the dark side. You remember what movie that was he said that in? <laughs> no, no, Kathy. No, Kathy. <laughs> so we've got David with the Dallas Cowboys, and we've got Kathy with Star Wars. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Star Wars. I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in the Catholic teaching on purgatory. It's not that I'm going to sit here and like argue it. But, man, if I think of purgatory. I think purgatory would be sitting there having to watch. Star Wars and having to watch. Let me see what else. Lord of the Rings. Oh, man. <laughs> man, that is torture. They sat me down and made me watch that three-hour movie. What was it? Bilbo Baggins or something like that? Bilbo Baggins. Oh, my goodness. Lord of the Rings. Give me, come on, give, give me the verse and I need to get out of here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Who's perfect love? For God so loved the world. He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish. There's, there's all I need to hear. If I'm not going to perish, I have no need of fear. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't fear, don't fear, fear not. It's 2020. What can you do in a brand new year if you refuse to view things through the prism of fear? Fear will sabotage your future, but placing everything in God's hands will guarantee its success. That's all I've got to say. Would you stand with me? Let's pray this, this morning. Great to have you guys this morning. Uh, Justin and Tammy.